Hey there, welcome to this special edition of Alpha Bunga Bunga, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. What comes next? This is a special episode on Brazil's election in partnership with Jacobin Magazine. I'm Alex Hochuli. Joining me and fellow Alpha Bunga Bunga producer Ben Fogel is Sabrina Fernandes. All three of us are regular contributors to Jacobin on Brazilian politics, and the latter two, Ben and Sabrina, are also contributing editors. Right now, I'm going to give a quick rundown on the state of affairs here in Brazil, focusing on the election. Brazil's swirling crisis sort of began in 2013, 2014, so I'd urge you to check out the writing in Jacobin at jacobinmag.com slash location slash Brazil for deeper background if you want it. So the first round presidential election is this Sunday, 7th of October. Leading the polls is the neo-fascist congressman and former paratrooper Jair Bolsonaro. He's a racist, a misogynist, a homophobe, as you may have read. His law and order policies are basically kill the poor. He's adopted an extremely liberal program and plans to privatize basically everything. And the latest polls show him leading on 31%, though he also has nearly 50% rejection rates, especially high amongst women. Second is Fernando Haddad of the Workers' Party, or PT. He's the nominated successor to Lula, who's in jail and ineligible. He's on 21%, and his rejection rates are high and rising. He's a moderate technocrat, former mayor of Sao Paulo, and yet the hostile anti-Workers' Party sentiment here, which is known as antipetismo, something we're going to make reference to throughout the episode, that makes him out to be some sort of radical. This loathing of the PT and by extension the rest of the left is something that unites the right. So what you've got is an election between PT and antipetismo, Bolsonaro being the extreme wing of antipetismo. The only candidate who could sneak in and break up this duopoly would be Ciro Gomes of the Democratic Labour Party. He's a centre-left developmentalist from an oligarchical family in the poor northeast state of Ceará. He's got much lower rejection levels uh, and could really appeal to those who neither want the fascists nor like the PT very much. He'd probably beat both Haddad and Bolsonaro in the second round runoff. However, he's in third on 11%. Therefore, it looks likely that it'll be a Haddad Bolsonaro runoff, the center left PT against extreme Anchipichismo. They're neck and neck in the polls, and it seems actually that the elite and the financial markets might actually prefer the fascists to the moderate Social Democrat. If Haddad wins, there's even potentially a fear of a military coup. PT has won four presidential elections in a row from 2002 onwards, and then it was deposed in a soft coup in 2016. If Pete win a fifth, might the Brazilian elite now resort to a hard coup? This is the ultra-politics of Brazil today. Alright, hi everyone, this is Alex Hochuli. I am delighted to welcome back Sabrina Fernandes, who's been on before. She's a contributing editor to Jacobin and has her own very popular YouTube channel called Tesi Onzi. Uh, most of the videos are in Portuguese, but there's uh, quite a few of them with English language subtitles, which I would encourage listeners to go check out. Uh, Sabrina also has a book coming out on the fragmentation of the Brazilian left, which should be out at the end of the year. I think it doesn't have a title yet. Um, I think Ben suggested that it could be called Why We're All Fucked. Um, which uh, <laughs> I think we'll come on to discuss. But uh, that, that book is based on Sabrina's really brilliant and insightful PhD thesis, uh, which is in English, which uh, is really worth a read. Um, I'm also joined by Ben Fogel, who actually exceptionally is not in Brazil now. He's in London. Is that right, Ben? Yeah, much to my despair. I'm in a country with a uh, future left-wing government, which will, uh, for, um, that seems happening any time now following Labour's successful conference last weekend. Uh, but I am cold, miserable, depressed, and lonely being outside of Brazil. Well, uh, that, still sound, that still sounds maybe better than being here and tearing one's hair out at the prospect of Bolsonaro winning the election. Um, I and mean, that's not a problem for me. I'm bold, so, you know, we've already passed that stage. But anyway, um, let's get... Both Sabrina and I have fine sets of hairs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, let's get started. Let's start first off with the Ele Não, the Not Him mass demonstrations, which happened over the last weekend of September, that's last weekend, which was led by women uh, and was very broad based. uh, And the main aim of it was rejecting Bolsonaro. 
Um, there were really big protests in Sao Paulo and Rio. Um, some estimates say that it was about 150,000 on the street in Sao Paulo, 200,000 in Rio. And the pro-Bolsonaro demonstrations, which happened around the same time or the following day, were much smaller. Um, and yet... You should, you should, you, you, don't be misled by all the photos circulating on Facebook, which they copied and pasted the same image to make as if there were 2 million people on the streets in Copacabana. <laughs> Yeah, lots of lots of fake news and altered images circulating. Um, but despite the numbers on the street, uh, I think, and this might be a place to start, um, Sabrina, they seem to be, according to research done in Sao Paulo, the demonstrators were very white, middle class, identifying as left wing and feminist. That is, it didn't really reach beyond uh, the kind of left or radical left constituency. I think the I think the most of the demonstrators were in the lead of the protest. Uh, they they fit that description, but I don't think that's the case at all. I I saw a lot of people who were just walking by and they decided to join the demonstration as well. Uh, but it, but it is mostly a left wing demonstration. But it's way beyond what leftists have been able to mobilize over the past two or three years. This is, this was way bigger than what we saw, for example, against Juma Rousseff's impeachment. So there's a lot to be said in that sense. Yeah, it was clearly uh, left-wing w- women uh, organizing the demonstration when uh, the demonstration was a result of this Facebook group as well that counted over 2 million women and that the uh, Bolsonaro supporters wanted to hack the group. They tried to hack it. They managed to hack it. And then Facebook had to get involved and everything else. Uh, but uh, it shows that when it comes to actually opposing Bolsonaro, Uh, some sort of leftist mobilization can actually go beyond this little group of the left that only normally mobilizes in Sao Paulo maybe 50 to 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. Sao Paulo, I actually think there were about 250 to 400,000. Rio did well as well. In Brasilia, there were uh, more people than we would usually see in a demonstration in Brasilia. So I think that we were able to burst the bubble a little bit and actually get to other people who have some sort of progressive sentiment. And I actually noticed that there were people in the streets that were um, center-right, something like that, people who are located within right-wing principles, but they also value democracy in some sense which is the opposite of the, Bolsonaro, uh, of the Bolsonaro camp. So I think that's important, uh, important to notice. There is some, some element of a democratic right in Brazil, but it's actually in the base. It, it tends to people and not to the leadership and the right, because PSDB and, um, and other uh, right-wing leaders like Alchemy, uh, they don't really support democracy, uh, even though uh, they, they will try to differentiate themselves from Bolsonaro whenever, whenever necessary. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I think the remarkable thing about this is the extent to which, to the extent that there was a real democratic center or center right in Brazil, that's really fallen away. And we're going to come on to discuss that in more depth. But the interesting thing here is that women uh, seem to be the firewall against Bolsonaro. The the spread between women. Go ahead. I I would also have to add women and particularly as well, people who live in the northeast of Brazil. Which, yeah. uh, which is the most historically most impoverished and blackest region. So if it, Bolsonaro is stopped these elections, it will be stopped by women and uh, the impoverished of the Northeast. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I think it's rarely been seen in Brazilian politics, such a spread um, in a candidate support between men and women. Um, though there was a poll just came out last night, I think, that showed that Bolsonaro had a little bit of a bump in the polls, which is really frightening. And that came mainly because upper middle class women swung over to Bolsonaro. Um, so that class dimension is is still very clear there. Uh, Bolsonaro, of course, being having the highest um, rates of support amongst the richest Brazilians, the most educated Brazilians. Yeah, I think particularly... I don't... You see, I don't... Oh, go uh, ahead, Ben. I was just going to say, particularly you see the sort of regional divide in Sao Paulo, which tends to be whiter and richer than the west, rest of the country, you really see this thing is that um, for so many people there, uh, Bolsonaro just appears to be the rational choice. I mean, the idea that you could think that there's a sort of democratic sentence to hold uh, is really something that people just don't seem to understand. And uh, I think particularly uh, Sao Paulo, which is the Brazil's biggest city and financial center, you rarely see this this phenomenon of this upper middle class, respectable, 
either Bolsonaro curious or open Bolsonaro voter kind of everywhere. Yeah. And I think this is something which is going to play itself out much more explicitly after next Sunday, after this coming Sunday, because right now we're only a couple of days away from the first round. So there's little um, room for both uh, for, for, for explicit Bolsonaro support and for uh, resistance, broad based resistance to Bolsonaro to really express itself. This is something that's going to come out only in the second round, which right at the moment looks likely to be between, uh, as you guys heard in the introduction, uh, Haddad of the Workers' Party and Bolsonaro. But it's still unclear. I mean, there's still room for uh, these things to fluctuate quite wildly in the last you know, three days before the election. Um, so without making ourselves too much hostage to fortune, <laughs> discussing scenarios which may prove not to be the case, I wanted to discuss a little bit, before we discuss exactly who Bolsonaro is and what Bolsonarism might be, um, maybe a comparison uh, to the Women's March, which sought out right from right from after um, Trump took office to resist Trump. And do we see similarities there? Uh, do we? Are there any strategic lessons to be learned from that? I mean, I, I was at the Women's March in Washington, and uh, the crowd definitely, uh, compared to what I saw, both at the relatively small demonstration I saw here in London, and from what I saw from my friends back in Brazil, uh, the politics are entirely different. In Brazil, it was openly left-wing, in many respects, it was more militant. It was more of a mass mobilization. It was something which clearly had to define politics in terms of uh, more of an oppositional statement. While the Women's March in Washington, D.C. was massive, it was kind of a failure, in, for me at least, as a South African used to a protest culture. It was kind of like people went there just to go there. They didn't really have any sort of unified message. And a lot of what I saw was just like messages about like, Putin's responsible for the rise of uh, Trump or like this sort of like anti-communist and anti-leftist discourse blaming Bernie or blaming these sort of otherworldly forces and in the end it wasn't even a march it was so big people couldn't even move so people just milled around waiting for something to happen and then left so well, I don't think in Brazil were anything close to that um, what it shows is that um, most of the time, we still have a problem within the left organizing in Brazil that they do recognize the power of feminism and bringing uh, feminist politics uh, within class politics and in the left in general. But most of the time, they don't really mobilize women. It's, uh, it's really up to women to handle themselves and um, put forward their own agenda. So this is important in the sense of like showing how in the left, women are the actual leaders who can actually mobilize people in the streets. Every other leader can't move as many people as women have been able to do. Uh, however, it was very militant. It was uh, very much uh, within a leftist storm. There was a lot of arguments in the streets over uh, the left-wing candidates as well. I, I, I saw a little bit of a competition going on between the people supporting Adaji, the people supporting Siru, the people supporting Bolus and everything like that. So the disputes were pre uh, present, but it managed to be an anti fascist march, which I think was very important too, because there was the, the tone of showing that even though we have all of these differences, uh, what, we stand together against this particular project that's being put forward by Bolsonaro. So there's a lot of potential there. However, um, part of the Bolsonaro camp grows on anti-feminism. So this actually adds to the polarization as well. And part of the Bolsonaro camp grows on anti uh, anti or the anti-PT sentiment, so going against the left. Uh, being anti-communist and everything. So the what, what we saw in the Ibopi, uh, I actually don't think the Ibopi poll is the, the best poll to pay attention to right now. I think that the Tafolia poll has mm -hmm. been a little bit more accurate. Um, but it, this, this uh, small margin of growth coming from Bolsonaro is not unexpected. Uh, we're actually like with the march or without the march, I don't think we will be able to see him dropping uh, very fast because he hasn't really dropped in a really long time. So his tendency is actually like, we know he would go to the second round for a really long time now. But the left hasn't been able to actually mobilize someone other than Lula who could go to the second round with him and come out very, very strong. Uh, that's not a case with Adaji. Uh, that was not a case with Ciro. Now Adaji supporters and Ciro supporters keep fighting uh, between each other and trying to um, steal votes from one another rather than actually going after this um, undecided base 
that tend to go towards Bolsonaro, either because they identify him with being anti-establishment, which is part of the persona he developed, he developed even though he is the establishment, and um, also because of the anti-PT sentiment. So there's a lot, a lot of things to work with that we had time to do it, but it wasn't allowed, right? The part of the, the, the problem that we have within the left is that we know that some sort of self-critique would be very important to rescue people from anti-PT sentiment and anti-left se uh, sentiment in general. The critique was not allowed. So right now, uh, every piece of fake news, every every contradiction that the PT is involved uh, in, even though sometimes it's actual, real contradictions, they're being used against the uh, Adagi candidacy and they're being used against the left in general to empower Bolsonaro. So it's actually a result of a, of a long process and not just what, what we've been seeing over the past six months or so. I think it's important to highlight, just to go uh, back quickly to the Women's March, which is that in, in contrast to the US or to Britain or to many Western European countries, there is no real room for the sort of thing you see there in Brazil. What I mean specifically is the sort of um, liberal, not necessarily that politicized, moderate, mainstream, pro-establishment center, um, even under a kind of a feminist banner, does not exist in Brazil. I mean, because the center has swung over so far to the right and is so anti pechista as Sabrina just described, any opposition to Bolsonaro has to be necessarily quite militant and of the left. I did, there is no real possibility for a broad-based um, opposition to Bolsonaro, which takes in a large part of the center, the establishment, even the center-right. But that's a question uh, which I think we'll have to come back to because um, this might be a, a, a really pertinent question in, come the second round. Ben, you want to jump in? Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's a really good point there. And I think it goes beyond that. Uh, so uh, what Sabrina was saying is that these were definitely like an anti-fascist. The spirit was an anti-fascist demonstration. While that definitely wasn't the case in the Women's March, while there have been more anti-fascist mobilizations against Trump, the Women's March didn't have that feel that politics or that aesthetic at all. And I think there's also points to perhaps maybe the difference between Bolsonaro, who is often compared to Trump, and Trump. While Trump is an odious person, and he's definitely on right wing, he's a bigot, he's a racist, he's a sexist, I don't think he's a fascist. I, I honestly mm -hmm. think that uh, if you really pay attention to Trump, he really styles himself as a businessman, first and foremost, he thinks he can make these deals. He's the author of Art of the Deal. He's the best deal maker. He's kind of like a very American creation that he's like an ultra pragmatist in that his uh, ability to make a deal is really what sums up his self-worth, his business acumen. Bolsonaro, on the other hand, I think is a sort of neo-fascist. His, uh, his responses to Brazil's deep economic and political crisis is basically violence. It's basically... We need to shoot our way through this mess. We need to uh, turn against these eternal enemies which have destroyed the nation. And uh, democracy is in the way of uh, moral redemption, which needs to be militarized at some level. So before we yeah, go, I, I, go ahead. I agree. Just, just, a, just a second. I agree with Ben on this also because during his campaign, Trump mobilized two, two types of depoliticization, right? So he mobilized post-politics in the sense of trying to come out as bigger than any ideological polarization in the country because of his business acumen, so I can actually fix the economy and things like that. And he mobilized ultra politics when it was important for him to create the, the image of an enemy, for him to oppose that enemy and seek redemption in that, in that way. Here in Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro is mobilizing ultra politics, never post politics. Uh, uh, in fact, like he is always very much the point that he is uh, the right wing, and the problem is the left. And when it comes to the economy, he has a trusted economist who's just going to do everything for him. Uh, people don't have to worry about it, but the thing is that he stands for order, and he stands for the elimination of the enemy, the elimination of the other. And that's what makes it so dangerous. And it, that's because Bolsonaro is often associated, and that's going to depend on whoever you're talking to in terms of definitions, either fascism or neo-fascism or proto-fascism, but something related to uh, the uh, authoritarian extremes pushed by the right wing here in Brazil. I think, I think we're all in agreement. This, uh, I, I just want to add one more point. I think also on this point, it's key to notice, uh, in terms of understanding sort of classical fascism, it was always a, a response to 
either uh, significant left-wing mobilizations or a, a left-wing project with actual power. Now, in the United States, where that didn't really exist, you couldn't see that sort of political polarization. But in Brazil, where, for, like it for the, uh, for the better or the worse, the left is identified with Pete, even if they weren't particularly radical in power, and they are still powerful and significant left forces, it means that the sort of classic anti-communist and anti-leftist polarization of fascism uh, is really present throughout uh, Bolsonaro's uh, rhetoric, and uh, he constantly invokes the threat of uh, sort of communist conspiracy and all these sort of like bogeymen which were present during Brazil's military dictatorship and didn't go away with the end of the Cold War. I think it's it's important to be extremely explicit here, and I think we're all in agreement here that Bolsonaro is in some form a fascist. I mean, it's some hybrid contemporary form uh, of neo-fascism, and it is a term that I think none of the three of us would use very flippantly, and we wouldn't want to throw it around as an insult. Um, I think it's worth, I mean, that's certainly on, on my part, I wouldn't call, for example, even Marine Le Pen necessarily as a fascist um, in today's term, whereas her father perhaps was a neo-fascist. I'm not sure Marine Le Pen is. So when I think we all say that Bolsonaro is a neo-fascist, we really mean that, and we really mean that in the specific sense that it is a recourse to the tools of, at the end of the day, um, civil war of violence to crush the left. So the, the kind of let me just make recourse to the media discussion on this, because I think for, for all our listeners not in Brazil um, and perhaps not intimately acquainted with the situation in Brazil, their um, understanding of the situation will come through a lot of the international media. So, you know, in the past, you know, couple of weeks, we've had The Economist cover coming out very strongly against Bolsonaro. Um, Foreign Affairs just did in an article. Um, but then you've had the, the financial papers being a little bit more circumspect. So the FT and Bloomberg, for example, kind of reporting what the market's voice is, saying, well, you know, kind of Bolsonaro might be kind of OK for the markets um, because he's going to privatize a lot of stuff. And uh, on the other hand, he's a little bit crazy, so he's not necessarily that trustworthy. Um, on balance, he might be just marginally better than the Petes Haddad, who is more moderate, but on the other hand, you know, is a leftist, supposedly. So... Um, so, you know, it, it's not really they, they don't really they kind of sit on the fence on this issue. And what a lot of these papers discuss and always will highlight is the fact that Bolsonaro is a misogynist, a racist, a homophobe and um, is pro torture. But these are all kind of peripheral aspects to the central question of whether or not he is a fascist. And I think, as um, Ben has just said before me there, with the crucial question is the relationship between um, the relationship to how they see the organized working class as the internal enemy and as something to be quashed. Uh, and that, I think, is quite explicitly what Bolsonaro proposes. Um, and I think one of the terms which has been already mentioned, which I think we should be a little bit more, um, we should maybe kind of unfurl a little bit, and I want to come to Sabrina here, is the question of ultra-politics. What is ultra-politics, could you tell us, Sabrina? So ultra-politics is uh, it's a concept that was coined by Slavoj Žižek uh, uh, in 1999, and then we actually just, like, Left it there, never really touched it again until it became obvious that our conjuncture around the world, and not just in Brazil, around the world, uh, has favored uh, the rise of a right wing, but not just any right wing, a more authoritarian right uh, that's coming forward, and sometimes even a fascist right like we're seeing here in Brazil, and in some parts, uh, uh, maybe in Eastern Europe, we, uh, we, could, uh, we could talk about that. But in the sense, ultra politics is a type of depoliticization. It means that we're not really making opposition in society, and our conflicts are not being dealt with in terms of class conflict. We're not being dealt with in terms of patriarchal conflicts within uh, white supremacy, uh, which means antagonisms that are based on our material conditions. So we we have. Uh, us in the left, we have our class enemies, and they are in the bourgeoisie. But with ultra politics, you create other enemies, and you mobilize around them. So you you can you, you can give your enemies any quality you want, because what you're trying to do is promote a false radicalization, so that you can be the essence of your enemy. So Bolsonaro is ex exactly that. He he started riding the wave of anti petismo because uh, the anti pt se sentiment is not new. Uh, the media has mobilized this for a really long time. Uh, this sentiment grew a lot because um, besides a lot of accusations made in the media, there are some material claims 
around the PT and corruption, but like within this Salon and other scandals as well, that gave it a lot of traction. So that's a problem as well. And the actual contradictions that led to the to the PT in power not being able to handle the elite. He was trying to be friends with, and he was trying to uh, keep uh, under under control in terms of class conciliation, right? So this situation created a room of depoliticization that the right wing was able to mobilize very well through hatred. So that's the main sentiment that the right has mobilized, hatred. And the problem is because the left is so disorganized and fragmented and lacks uh, potential projects and lacks uh, uh, self-critique that will be very important for us to be able to talk about alternatives again because part of the, the damage that the class conciliation project of the PT did in Brazil was that uh, we weren't allowed to talk about alternatives. We weren't allowed to talk about utopia and our dreams. We had to accept that the type of government that the PT was putting forward was the only type of government ever possible under the circumstances here in Brazil. So this causes demobilization as well. So the left is not prepared to handle this ultra-political tactic by the right. So instead, the left is actually mobilizing fear instead. Like, so fear of Bolsonaro. Of course, of course if uh, these new fascist guys coming forward, we're all afraid. But there's a difference between being afraid and mobilizing our fear uh, instead of mobilizing hope and mobilizing care and mobilizing things that, for example, Bernie Sanders were able to, uh, was able to mobilize within the primaries. It's interesting that this politics of fear that the left mobilizes as well, because it's often dis the pol politics of fear is often ascribed to the right, you know, d demonizing the immigrant or the drug addict or the poor or whatever kind of marginal um, group in society um, as a scapegoat. And but the left does it as well. And I think this is something that which emerged, you know, in, in 2002 in France very clearly, where uh, Le Pen made it to the second round and the left all grouped together to mobilize this this politics of fear, which, as you say, can be very depoliticizing. Um, I think one interesting thing of, of about the notion of ultra politics, which I agree with you, Sabrina, it's a very useful way of looking at these things, is um, if you have class politics, if you have these divisions in society based in material conditions, uh, one way of that kind of is the establishment deals with it, that liberalism deals with it, is by trying to circumscribe it, by trying to funnel it into the narrower constraints of, you know, parliamentary politics and, and um, institutions. Uh, what ultra politics tries to do is just smash that all away, right? That it tries to create a war against its enemies um, by positing a sort of insurpassable antagonism. This was this is something that you know traditional fascism of the of the interwar period. M you can understand the logic because it was trying to take on organized communism. There were real. There was the Russian Revolution. There was the German Revolution, and ultra politics in the form of fascism was trying to smash that. It's an interesting question then in today's Brazil. Why why this ultra politics in today's Brazil when there is no threat of revolution? There is no communist threat. They'll point fingers at Venezuela, saying Brazil will become a Venezuela, but there's n that's just not a realistic possibility in any sense. So why why this uh, why this uh, ultra politics today? Uh, I think. Well, there, uh, oh, go ahead, Ben. Uh, I think what we really need to focus this question even more down, and then I think Sabrina has a good uh, answer to this. But I'm just give some description description here. It's really interesting that. Uh, as Sabrina has mentioned, the project of the Pete and Power was extremely moderate. It offered a macroeconomic macro orthodoxy and make grow the pie and then spread bits of the new pie to the poor sort of model of uh, development rather than anything which was uh, polarizing or based on mobilizing against elites. But for some reason, and I think this is, lies deep in the sort of Brazilian unconscious, which you see really going to Bolsonaro, a section of the elite found this too much. They found the entry of uh, the Brazil's untouchables, the wretched of Brazil, the black, the poor people from the northeast, and into the Brazilian public sphere, into Brazilian spaces previously uh, reserved for the elite as something fundamentally unconscionable, a form of corruption, something which upset the natural order. So this rage and this really deep-seated rage, which I don't fully understand against the Pete, which goes from uh, people, too many people being in the airports, the wrong type of people being in the airports, 
people going to elite universities through quotas, people uh, driving too many cars in the street, all of the, uh, or even like receiving m small social grants from the government as the sort of great injustice, as this thing to get really worked up upon. And uh, you really see this sort of like extreme rage without really un something which is like a solid threat to people. So if people feel like, and there's been some arguments made by, say, like Alfredo Saad Filio, uh, that um, the upper middle class, or these sections of upper middle class, were the one section uh, under Pete which didn't do so well of uh, Brazilian society in that they found their privileged access to state jobs and uh, elite universities threatened by the entrance of new social sectors expanding through social citizenship, which was what the Pete represented. And there was a big pushback from that. But I don't fully understand it, mm. and uh, I think it's something which puzzles me to this day. Hey there, sorry to interrupt, but we just wanted to say hi to our new listeners. If this is your first time, here's a little bit about us. We do long-form interviews and discussions on politics and ideology, and occasionally cultural episodes, with a particular focus on the current global conjuncture, that is, the breakdown of the neoliberal order, and what comes next. I'm regular host Alex Hochuli, but the podcast is also produced by George Hoare and Phil Cunliffe, both based in the UK, and by Ben Fogel, based in Brazil, along with myself. Coming up in the next few weeks, we're talking to Amber Lee Frost on the patriarchy and the family. We've got Anna Katchen on modern relationships, Alex Gurevich on the political theory of the entrepreneur, Will Davis on neoliberal breakdown and public emotionalism, as well as all that, we have our regular episodes looking at specific country politics around the globe. If you like us, follow us on Twitter, Facebook. Please share our stuff and tell your friends. Okay, that's it. Back to it. Well, um, I think there's a lot of things that relate to it. For example, uh, what we have today uh, that makes social politics so viable is that we have a lot of empty signifiers. Uh, this means that we have a crisis of representation. Uh, the crisis of re representation is real. A lot of the people who vote for Bolsonaro, and a lot of people who vote for Haddad, for PT, uh, for, for Lula, and everything like that, they don't really vote because that's their ideology, because that's their political project. It's because they don't really feel represented, but they vote anyway, especially because in Brazil, uh, voting is mandatory. So that's part of the process. So if you have empty signifiers, so uh, important things, for example, the, the notion of democracy uh, in Brazil is a notion that was never really expanded on. Well, our process after we came out of the military dictatorship uh, did not really, uh, it didn't go after the, the military that tortured people, for example. So uh, this uh, difference between dictatorship and democracy is very blurred for a lot of people. So the right can bank on that. Uh, other notions in terms of what means to be right wing, what means to be left wing, a lot of people associate the PT with communism. So that's why they think there's a communist threat. They think uh, because they associate communism with uh, Bolivarianism, so they associate it with Chavez and Maduro and, and Bolivia and Venezuela and Cuba, and everything's all the same. And this is part of this constru construction of the perfect enemy. Because if you, if you build an enemy like that, if the right is able to do so, they can actually mobilize anything against it because you create a real threat. You create a menace. And uh, better than fear when you have a menace like that is immobilate hatred. Because then people feel uh, repulsed by it. They, they don't want anything to do with it. And then they're going to start rejecting dialogue. They're going to reject reason. They're going to reject us intervening and pointing out, oh, no, that's fake news. Oh, that's not really the case. Oh, yeah, that was a contradiction. But that's, that, that doesn't mean uh, that everything is lost. Like, we're not able to get into these kind of conversations because we created something that people just find abhorrent, that people can't really deal with. And that's part of the ultra-political tactic. It's so, so intelligent in that sense because that allows you, for you, uh, that allows you to create moral panics, for example. Uh, one of the strong mobilizers of hatred here in Brazil is the idea around children, that communism is going to worry our children and teach five and six years old to have sex with people from the same sex. Actually, right? Sabrina, so, I'm, glad, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I want to come in on, on this and, and press a little bit more on this. The nature of Bolsonaro's support consists in many different things, and one of it is culture war. I'm not, I don't think it's a definitive aspect, and I don't think it's the real core to Bolsonarismo. But I think it's important to discuss the kind of new culture war which has emerged in Brazil over the past couple of years. 
Um, oh, yeah, I think, I, I think that's to the point because uh, we have these right-wing intellectuals and they've, they've done work over the past 20 years or more trying to point to everyone that the left in Brazil had a cultural Marxism project that coming from uh, this particular read of Antonio Gramsci and that because of all these Gramscians, we had this project to change people's mind into communism and convert people, and that gender ideology was part of it. So they were able to mobilize it because people are afraid of what they don't know really well. And uh, it, it's very easy for you to take things out of context when it comes to that and add children in between. And we know that the, the, the child aspect is very important. Uh, every single piece of very authoritarian uh, legislation that we've seen around the world over the past decade, for example, use children at some point to mobilize it, some sort of moral panic. We have to protect the children. So we have to protect the children from immigrants. We have to protect the children from terrorism. We have to protect, protect the children from predators who are online, but instead of just going after the predators, they're actually spying on regular citizens. So they use that kind of mobilizers, and they've been doing that, uh, trying to create fear, a uh, fear of uh, LGBTQ people, and by doing so, creating hatred as well against uh, LGBTQ people and feminists and so on. So that's really important. So there's a cultural element, but we do have an economic element. I just have a slight disagreement with the uh, with the reading. That's actually because we have. Um, just like we have more poor people at the universities or at the airports and so on. I think that's a consequence, and that irritates people in more of a personal sense, the, the people who want to feel very privileged, and they want the separation, they want the segregation, they want black people on one side, and they want themselves on the other, and they want to be superior and dominating in that sense. I think that's part of it, but there's an economic element that pushes this, and I think that's way stronger than the... Um, they're not wanting to run into poor people at the airport, which is the fact that there were income transfers from the middle class to the poorer classes. classes. Uh, this is part of the, the studies done not only by uh, Thomas Piketty, but other economists and sociologists as well, um, that the small reduction in inequality that was accomplished by the PT was very much related to transfers from the middle class to the poorer class and not from the upper classes. So that created a little bit of resentment. And also there were worker, uh, workers' rights that were actually important during that period. For example, we have this uh, slave, uh, slavery uh, inheritance in Brazil that comes uh, with the domestic workers. So a lot of middle class people just wanted to keep their privileges by exploiting women working for them in their homes without paying them any workers' rights. And uh, during the PG government, that changed. So there was... Uh, some some sort of financial burden in that sense as well. When it comes to the universities, it's not just because, oh, yeah, I don't want to run into poor people at the universities because I paid, my parents paid for my education my whole life, and I want to go to public universities and be part of this intellectual elite. That's an element. But even more than that, it means that now you're going to have a more a democratic university that's going to change the debates that are going on over there. Class struggle is going to be part of this debate. And once these people graduate, they're going to be in the job market. So that makes it harder for uh, the, the child, like the, the son or the daughter of an upper middle class person to go to university and just go straight into a job because the market's more competitive. Because a lot of the people that never got a chance to get these more qualified jobs now they're getting a chance to do so. So there's an economic element that mm -hmm. I think is really important and sometimes get, gets missed. For example, the Adagi interview that he, he gave to us at Jacobi and you guys were there, he was very uh, uh, strongly pointing out how the middle class in Brazil and the elite, they have a lot of prejudice. I think prejudice is part of the Brazilian culture. Brazilian culture is racist. Um, this is part of the element, but there's this economic resentment that I think is way stronger, and Bolsonaro was able to mobilize very well. In fact, he mobilizes it with the middle class, but he also mobilizes it with the, with the poor people mm -hmm. because 
there, uh, like these entrepreneurs are buying into Bolsonaro's uh, campaign, and they're trying to replicate this idea that, well, um, you're poor, but you're always going to be poor with socialism, because socialism is about uh, distributing poverty all around. Only capitalism can save you. So part of that economic ideology is actually making its way down to the people, even though we all know trickle-down uh, economics doesn't work, uh, that's been proven, but... Uh, because it's all the 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 terrain so depoliticized, it's making its, uh, its way down to people who are making less less than a, the minimum wage here in Brazil. Actually, I think there's another point point to come in here, which we haven't discussed about the rise of uh, Bolsonaro, which is Brazil's security crisis. So, sixty three thousand Brazilians were murdered last year, which is a huge number. It's uh, it's more people than apparently died in Syria last year. Uh, it's war numbers, and uh, although it's important to re- say that the geography of violence is very particular in Brazil, because uh, in particular Sao Paulo, which is the richest city of Brazil, the murder rate has gone down consistently, and even with the collapse of public security in Rio and the real crisis there, the numbers and the murder rate still isn't at historic highs. But in many respects, the violence in Brazil is in new places. It's in the northeastern cities which had not really been hotspots for organized crime and drug trafficking. And also in the south, we have cities like Curitiba and Porto Alegre, which had always been seen as more peaceful and prosperous cities, suddenly becoming very dangerous in a short period of time. And because of this real fear that people have of, and it's based on these huge numbers, and uh, in Rio you have sometimes to check apps to see where the shootings are to plan your route to work, uh, this way that the breakdown in public security or the increase in violence in particular regions means real real fears, not just for the middle class, but for the working class too. And uh, yeah, I agree. unfortunately, uh, under the PT, uh, it was always the police, the military pacification, a slightly more uh, moderate version of uh, business as usual in dealing with this policing crisis. Uh, that Brazil has, because the Brazilian police killed more people than anywhere else in the world that we know of. Mexican police probably kill more, but that's a whole other story. But because of this, um, the left, probably since Brizola, hasn't really adopted any sort of coherent... Brizola was a Brazilian populist leader who was mayor and governor of Rio who took on the military police uh, in the 1980s. But since then, there hasn't been a direct confrontation with Brazilian police and the structures of Brazilian violence. But Bolsonaro does is he says the problem is, is the gays, the women, the people who care about human rights, the communists have told us that uh, they're in league with the criminals. They tell us we have to respect their rights. So my solution is to kill more. It's to increase the level of violence. Let the police off the hook. And if the police kill like six, seven thousand people a year already, God knows, officially, probably more unofficially, God knows how many they would kill if they let off the hook. It's really just to up the ante so we can shoot our way through the problems. And in the context of uh, demoralization and depoliticization, a lack of solutions, as Sarita Perina was pointing out, a lack of ideas or hope to deal with this horrible problem with organized crime. And much of the states in league with organized crime and uh, violence and the breakdown uh, in security. Uh, it sounds redemptive. It's always been a redemptive function of politics is violence. And uh, this sort of redemptive function of violence as a way to both redeem Brazil, purge its eternal enemies and deal with its real security crisis has a lot of appeal. I think you guys have both sort of almost preempted the question I had jotted down, which was to talk about exactly who is Bolsonaro's support, who are their supporters, um, and try to segment them out. And I think um, maybe you know, as a way of resuming this a little bit, summarizing this a little bit, uh, you have kind of anti-pechismo, which is motivated by a sort of middle class resentment at losing its relative position versus the poor and the working class. Uh, you have the kind of culture war element, which is uh, those who are, you know, driven by a sort of moral panic, um, a lot kind of based around children, around sexualization, um, all these kind of culture wars themes, which will be familiar to those, to certainly to American listeners. Um, and then you probably have a kind of harder core of fascist or, you know, authoritarian supporters who dream of the return of the military dictatorship, um, who are just really much kind of stronger law and order type voters, um, which is probably, um, you know, the, the kind of nucleus of Bolsonaro's support, but which has obviously been added to by the um, 
by the addition of these other sectors uh, across society, really, including the poor who are or the, you know, certain sectors of uh, of the working class who are scared of violence. Um, so I think I wanted to talk a little bit about this latter section, the kind of hardcore um, authoritarian base of Bolsonaro support and specifically discuss it in reference to the possibility, I think now a very re- real possibility of a military coup, um, either when Bolsonaro, if Bolsonaro wins or if he loses. Um, and just to sketch out this scenario, um, it's something that I've made reference to in the introduction, but if Haddad wins, if the PT wins, there is a very real possibility that you know, one, he faces an immediate governability crisis. Uh, and two, you know, the elite in Brazil has seen PT win four presidential elections in a row, only to depose it in a soft coup in early 2016, and put its principal leader and Brazil's greatest working class leader in prison, only to see PT retake the presidency. Um, in those conditions, it's very feasible, very possible to imagine a military coup. There's also the Bolsonaro route, which is a more electoral route, uh, a sort of military coup through the back door, uh, through which Bolsonaro appoints uh, and gives over several ministries to military rulers. Um, I wanted to come to Ben a little bit to discuss kind of who the people are around Bolsonaro, because I think this is possibly the most frightening aspect um, of Bolsonaro's candidature. Uh, it's not just the hostile anti pachismo it's not just the culture war stuff, it's not just the racism, the misogyny, the homophobia. It is the fact that this might actually have a vehicle uh, for authoritarian power for a form of neo-fascism today, which is via this military route. Uh, I just want to say um, a couple things before I go into these details. One is that one of the most misleading narratives coming out of this election, which is really taken up in particular by Brazil's establishment media houses, particular, particularly Estadão and Folha de São Paulo, which are to Brazil, particularly in Sao Paulo's biggest newspapers. And then this feeds into a lot of foreign coverage you see in Reuters, you see in other newspapers that really presents this uh, election story as one about polarization between the far left, which is represented by Pete and Hadaji, who you know, a few years ago, Pete was the darling of the business press, the economist saying this was a leftist government that respected markets, suddenly becoming sort of this communist menace and Bolsonaro on the far right. And what that does is it sort of says this is a polarization story instead of just one. 